Okay, I think I'll get started, if that's all right. So, um, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to day two of our boot camp. Um, I'm going to be talking about read alignment today and read mapping. Um, and before I start, I just wanted to say that um, when we were organizing the workshop, and I should say we, I mean uh, literally Ron Shamir, because he didn't just do most of the work, he did all of the work. Um, we're discussing what kind of topics to do and how boot camps work. And the, the goal of a boot camp is kind of not to give a research talk, but to give a, an introduction um, that's suitable for students and postdocs and also those who are just from outside the field. And so I tried to prepare the, uh, the talk with that in mind. And, um, and sort of, sort of shortly after we started to, to think about this, I, I started trying to think about um, you know, where to begin in the beginning, um, because I wanted to give sort of a bit of a historical overview. Um, and so the thing is, I realized that I have a bit of a challenge, because my topic doesn't exist. Um, so I went to uh, this thing called the Google Ngrams viewer, which has uh, mined the corpus of all books. Uh, in English and other languages. And there you can type words like sequence alignment or read alignment, and it shows usually two plots. This is the usage of the word sequence alignment in books. And you can see that the subject is kind of, uh, you know, it's a little bit hard to see because of the scale, but that's 1970, and then sort of taking off in the, in the, in the 80s and 90s. But read alignment sort of just blanked. There was not a single example of the term read alignment in the entire corpus of the English language. So, now, I tried to move this up to, two, you cannot, this ends in 2008. So I thought, okay, maybe it's that. All right. Yes? Does that cover like journals and so on, or just really books? This covers books. Yeah, that's what I Yeah, you're right. So then I went to where I gather all my information when I prepare talks, and I went to Wikipedia. <laughs> And there's no Wikipedia page for read alignment, if you can believe that. And then I knew I was in great trouble, because that goes my secret you know, trick for preparing all my like, sort of introductory talks. So there's, um, <clears throat> you know, there's a page about this program called Bowtie. I'll say a word about it later. There's lists of software. You heard already a bit about the Burr's Wheeler transform, which is used in read alignment. But there's no actual, and Hang Lee is, of course, uh, Mr. Read Alignment. But there's no kind of uh, page about read alignment, so I knew I was in trouble. So I thought, OK, uh, journals, conferences, somewhere. I guess. So I went, first of all, I should say actually that there is a page for sequence alignment, but it's very long, but it has one line about read alignment. Um, so that wasn't useful. So I, I went to, um, I searched Recom. You know, this is the main conference. I, First went to Recom in, two, uh, I think, in the very first Recom in Santa Fe many years ago. Um, so you can search through Recom on Google Scholar. It's actually a couple of hundred papers uh, have appeared in Recom. And that constitutes, in my mind, kind of the corpus of computer science for biology, uh, yearly annual conference that's important in our field. And there are exactly three papers in the entire Recom that have ever mentioned the word read alignment, uh, the phrase read alignment. And so, uh, these two, you know, so these two over here actually have read alignment in a citation. So this is uh, from the citations. Um, Lee and Durbin uh, wrote one of the first papers uh, on the Burris Wheeler transform. And then there's one single paper, um, which is actually not quite about read alignment. It's about, uh, it's from Seraphim Batzoglu's group. Um, it was just in the last recom in 2015. It's about something called um, molecular uh, technology. Um, I'll say maybe something about it. It's a new technology for kind of building long fragments of DNA from short reads. It's completely obsolete, actually, already. And so, in fact, this paper and its companion in genome research have no citations, and we'll see how that goes because. The technology no longer really exists in a way. It's kind of been completely obsolete already in a, in a year. And that's actually an interesting point um, because um, you know, one of the issues with this particular lecture and this whole subject is that it's very technology-focused frequently. And so 
Um, so there you go. So there's no recom. Uh, and um, so I, I tried um, to go back to the actual Simons Institute website to figure, maybe I got the wrong talk, you know. Like, uh, there's no topic that I'm supposed to talk about. But it said mapping and alignment. And so I went back and tried to read mapping, because I, maybe uh, the read alignment's not there. Well, there's, there's no read mapping either. In entire recom has never been mentioned a single time. Now you might say maybe Recom actually is a conference that has a, a really great actually companion meeting that I went to in 2015 uh, in Poland, uh, based uh, for for kind of sequencing specifically. But that meeting's fairly new, um, and you would think that there would be something in Recom. Um, so aside from the paper by Serafim Batzoglu, who's on the steering committee of uh, of the conference, um, there's nothing. So that's the state of alignment. It's a topic nobody cares about. So. I'll, I'll try to do my best, though, to convince you that it's sort of interesting, maybe. Uh, and maybe I'll answer the question why I think it's never been in any of these conferences uh, books. Um, so I thought about this for a while, and I realized maybe I should talk actually about sequence alignment. Now, it's a bit awkward because there's been an entire day, and, and Dan Gusfield just gave an extraordinary uh, they're all on video, by the way, uh, to go back at you know, like an entire day of lectures with Mike Waterman. Um, and they literally wrote the book, uh, so to speak. Um, but I realized that you know, if you go and look at, uh, um, at sequence alignment, um, there's lots and lots of papers. And I realized that to really talk about read, uh, a read alignment, I maybe should talk about sequence alignment and try to explain the difference. Because unfortunately, the thing is that when it comes to sequence alignment, it's frequently presented in written about is a kind of uh, string matching uh, kind of endeavor. But in fact, uh, and read alignment, sequence alignment, whatever those things are, they're both about matching strings, but in sort of very different ways. And I think it's important to understand the context in the biology and the difference to really understand why they're not really the same subject okay, in a way. So what I'm going to do in the, uh, in the tutorial today is um, basically go through a couple of definitions and try to tell you what I actually think biological sequence alignment is, uh, because uh, that wasn't done yesterday, so that would be something new. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what read alignment is, what read mapping, um, and then kind of uh, compare and contrast. Um, and then I'll tell you a bit about the algorithms for these things. Um, I'll tell you, I know you've heard about the Barzwiller transform. I'll say a word about that. Uh, I'm not going to go too much in depth into the algorithms. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about BLAST for a number of reasons. Um, I'll talk about a new concept. I've tried to keep research material out of this tutorial, but there is one thing I do want to discuss, pseudo alignment. Um, it also relates to assembly, which is one of the topics for this week. So, uh, so that's kind of the outline. And I'll try to sprinkle in a few questions um, that are algorithmic. Um, for people to think about for the, for the remaining semester. So let me start with sequence alignment and explain what I think it really is, uh, just my personal opinion, but I think it's important, as I said, to understand. And so uh, for me, sequence alignment actually begins with this famous uh, picture of Darwin's notebook where he drew the first phylogenetic tree. Um, and. Actually, not the first tree. Lamarck before him drew lots of trees, but they were just slightly different. The Lamarck's trees had the interior nodes labeled, and uh, Darwin only labeled the leaves. That's really the difference between them. And, um, and so really, uh, this picture is famous. It's shown frequently in talks. Um, what I like to say about this picture is that it's actually a mathematical statement. And Darwin never did any math, but he appreciated math. Um, he was terrified of it. But I actually credit him for a math idea. And I'd like to tell you what it is. It's related to sequence alignment. Underlying Darwin's picture is actually, um, and you've seen many trees like this, all of you, I'm sure, even those of you from outside of uh, computational biology. Underlying this picture is this notion in computer science of what's called a hierarchy. And a hierarchy is um, a uh, collection of sets, if you like. So this notation 2 to the x, there's a set x, in this case, a, b, c, d. And 2 to the power of x are all the subsets of x. And in a hierarchy, um, you have a collection of subsets of a set. So e1 and e2 are subsets of x. And they satisfy a condition that any pair of them 
are either disjoint or one is contained inside the other. And so just in this example of Darwin's tree, the set X has A, B, C, D, which label the leaves here. I should say that in this picture of Darwin, um, you know, other than you can read, I think, it's a little bit hard to read that part, and he certainly did think. Um, you have these little feet. Those are the extant species in the tree. And then the, the branches that are sing, like sort of no, don't have feet are extinct species, species that went extinct. Um, but he labeled A, B, C, D. They're kind of extant species. And one is the root of the tree. That's kind of the common ancestor. And in this picture, in the set X, you have a, the, a hierarchy which consists of the following sets, A, B, C, D, and then the set B, C, D, and then the set A, B, C, D. And this hierarchy, if you think about it for a second, you'll realize that these are the leaves. The BCD is the ancestor of these three extant species. And then ABCD is the ancestor of all of the taxa. So in fact, a hierarchy represents a set of extant species and their common ancestors. And it's a theorem that's actually not hard, but it's a little exercise for the afternoon to prove that every semi-labeled tree like this, that is to say a tree with whose, file, whose leaves are labeled, a rooted tree like this, corresponds uh, to a set system like this, and every set system uh, to one of these pictures. So they are in bijection with each other. And uh, this fact is actually, you know it's kind of an important fact because it has many names. So I said this was a computer science idea, and in fact, it's not. A hierarchy is the combinatorics. The math people call this a hierarchy. The computer scientists call this a laminar family. And it's used a lot in proving things about al greedy algorithms, this kind of bijection. It's a basic concept in computer science. Um, uh, you know, in, in Dan's book, I think, uh, Dan Gusfield's book, I think it's called a, uh, a perfect phylogeny, maybe, let's say. So it's got many names because in mathematics, you know, good ideas keep cropping up, people, different people figure them out. So, um, so yeah, so I've written, I've written up a couple of the, the, the names here. So, um, so Darwin kind of had this idea, not in the context of math, although let's give him the credit for that. I think he deserves it. Um, he had it in the, in, in the context of biology. He really imagined that these leaves are you know, birds, like finches or some other kind of species. That's what he had in mind. But what's really different, starting in the mid-60s, around early to mid-60s, is that biologists started to think about this structure, but with first protein sequences and later DNA sequences labeling the leaves of this tree. That kind of was a fundamental conceptual change in biology because it's a different idea to think of the actual objects that are evolving being actual nucleotides or amino acids or polymers of some kind than actual entire species, right? That's kind of a very different thing. And I've tried to do homework on this, and I believe, actually, that the very first example um, of doing a kind of actual sequence analysis or alignment goes back to Linus Pauling in the, uh, 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 an Emil Zucker candle in around uh, 1963 at Caltech. They kind of uh, started by uh, uh, sequencing globins, different globins, and actually doing alignments of them uh, in the string sense that you heard about yesterday. So taking the strings and trying to fit them together and compare them. But what they were really doing is actually trying to sort of fit together the evolutionary history of these sequences. And I'm going to try to belabor this point, actually. So what they were really doing was and later when they, sort of, when they and others switched to using DNAs, when they were kind of trying to match these strings up, they were trying to actually say, look, this nucleotide and that nucleotide and this one, they have a common ancestry in the sense of this hierarchy of Darwin. So that's what they mean. And so in fact, my view of what a sequence alignment is, I call it a homology forest. Because in biology, this word homology means that different characters, let's say nucleotides, DNA sequences, have a common ancestry. And what you should really think of is a big forest like this, and it's just a very horrible conceptual picture, but you have lots of little trees. 
They might be different, they might be the same. And each one of them, each one of its tips is labeled with a sequence character of one of the genomes, let's say, that you're looking at. And they're all related to each other. And all of these trees, they, they may be slightly different because different nucleotides may have a different history. They're all related to each other because there's a species evolution on top of them. So that's kind of a more complicated way to think of things. But I truly think of alignments like this. So for example, when you see genomes being aligned, what really you should actually think of in your mind is not the strings and their comparison, but you should actually think of the individual nucleotides, which I've here just picked some um, from different chromosomes. So this is a literally some nucleotide in the genome. You should think about it being related to possibly other nucleotides in the same genome, because some nucleotides in the same genome have a shared common ancestry by duplication. Um, but some nucleotides you know, have ancestry with other species. And of course, it's very, very complicated. And it's actually a true forest and not a tree, because there are copying errors during replication. And nucleotides just pop up, and nucleotides get deleted. So not every nucleotide shares a common ancestry with every other nucleotide. That might be true for all the species on Earth, but not for their genomes. So when we're doing a sequence alignment, we're actually building a vast number of trees like this. Now, people try to fixate on this goes with that and this and that. But actually, part and parcel of the whole problem is to figure out the tree that relates them as well. And that's very difficult, but often necessary to get the correspondences right. So that's what sequence alignment is all about. It's a horribly difficult problem. Um, yeah, so you know, people, as I said, they fixate on these ovals, but their real question is very difficult. And actually, I don't know if you remember the very first slide with the Google engrams. It went up and up and up, but then it sort of was wobbly on top. And that's basically because this is so hard that not actually many people are working on it. So I don't actually know of many groups that are trying to really do the research into whole genome alignment right now. It's a difficult problem. Yeah. Um, so what about the chicken at the bottom right by itself? Oh, that was my point, that this particular nucleotide, right, it might be a completely new insertion in the chicken. So it just sits alone. And you want to identify those as well. So actually, there's even more complexity here, because really, you ought to kind of, in an ideal world, you'd be able to label each one of these nodes with a date or a generation. Right? And that's really hard. It's probably not a problem you can actually solve, but it's an interesting question how far you can get. And you know, that's, so that's why I put this here exactly. I should have said that. Thank you. So how does this truly relate to kind of the pictures that we're more used to in biological sequence alignment? Well, you know, we have um, often sequences like this uh, kind of lying on top of each other with these dashes for gaps. I'm suggesting that you really ought to imagine that decorated on top of this picture, or decorating the picture, are these trees. And they might be different, and you'd like to know them. All right? And the point is that, uh, I should say, when you look at this picture, it's not just that there are trees decorating each column. The columns actually have an order, because the sequences have an order. And so there's actually a relationship between the trees. And there's actually. Um, you know, quite a lot of difficult, different complicated things that can happen. From this evolutionary point of view, this is a valid sequence alignment, where these set, you know, three sequences share some history, and these share history, and the two sets don't share any history at all. Um, so actually, the order in which I put these two sets doesn't matter. right? I could have flipped them around. But within each of them, the order matters, because they're real sequences. So to my knowledge, it, Pretty much with one or two exceptions, there are no software programs, for example, in biology that can even output this actual kind of picture. Right? Because when you just think of comparing strings directly, um, actually, this kind of solution almost always has kind of score of minus infinity or probability zero. Because you can always kind of maybe shift over something a little bit. You know, there's an N right there, and it matches up. Maybe you just shove those together. Okay? But maybe it's not the right evolutionary answer. So um, I wanted to actually say that this issue, uh, this is not what my talk is about today. This is just an aside. It's quite important, actually. There's a database called SCOP. And um, there's actually some other databases as well. These are databases that create protein sequences and structures. 
And actually one of the pioneers in doing this is Stephen Brenner, who's here uh, at Berkeley and here in the room and going to be around the workshop, so a good person to talk to. Um, in this kind of database, these kind of alignments actually are important because often proteins have domains that don't relate to each other or there are just representatives in the database that are actually unrelated and so you'd like to completely yank them apart. So there's a kind of actual structure to this and I'll stop with the sequence alignment in a minute because it's really a tutorial about uh, read alignment. But the actual structure for thinking about sets of forests uh, of trees is a concept called the phylogenetic orange. And um, I'm not going to talk about it today, but for those who are interested, I have notes from a course I taught here at Berkeley once about this object. And uh, it's, uh, it comes up in phylogenetics, but it's actually a sequence alignment object. And I think it would be very interesting to think a bit about those sort of things. There's also an actual more computer science structure for thinking about alignments that relates the evolutionary homology force perspective I just gave to the standard stringology perspective. And that's the notion of a DAG or partially ordered set on the columns of a, an alignment. So in, in this representation, a standard alignment is actually a directed acyclic graph with numbers on the nodes so that as you go from bottom to top, you always increase the number. This is called the topological ordering. And there have been a couple of folks who've written papers about this kind of structure for alignments and, um, and worked with that. Uh, again, each one of these nodes has a tree decorating it, uh, but you know, in this kind of setting, you can kind of shuffle order around when nodes are not ordered by this partially ordered set or this DAG. So this is all nice, but uh, it has, you know, theoretically, it's fun to think about phylogenetic oranges. Um, but it actually has practical significance, and, and that will bring me to read alignment, uh, because I'm going to make a key point for, for the tutorial. So when people just compare strings, they run into trouble with actual biological sequences. And there's a very nice paper making exactly this point. It's by Herton Lunter a couple of years ago, back when it's right at the, this is right the year when the last year for sequence alignment before all those folks switched over to read alignment. Um, wrote a very nice paper um, kind of pointing out that there's these kind of four issues with sequence alignments. And he gave them names gap wonder, gap attraction, gap annihilation, two different types of gap attraction. And basically what he was saying is, you know, there's just cases that happen in practice where you, you have, for example, this setting where GCG um, could actually uh, you know, wonder between these two sides um, because maybe it fits pretty well to both. A's and G's um, transition are basically have a higher probability than A's to C's. And then there's sort of gap attraction. If you have a sequence and then in the middle an exact match, alignment programs will kind of tend to glue these together because it becomes difficult to model all the kind of, uh, I think Dan Gusfield actually said this, you know, it's hard, you, you, you run out of scores and scoring schemes eventually, and so you get these kind of issues. Um, and, uh, you know, I like this one. You know, this might be the true evolutionary story, but it's sometimes just easier to just shove everything together and it gives you a slightly higher score by whatever metric you pick. And it's not a theorem, but it's the truth that no matter what you try to do with standard alignment schemes, uh, you, you, the, for every alignment scheme there exists some, um, a corner case that, that, will ha that one should name that looks like this. Okay. And the resolution to this is not to try to go about making fancier and fancier and fancier scoring schemes for alignments, but to think about things statistically. And I was really happy when uh, Dan Gusfield yesterday actually said those exact words. Um, what you'd really kind of like to do is take a picture like this and make it into a picture like this, where these colors somehow intuitively tell you that you're not so reliable about gluing together these things or those things. And um, I'm going to try not to talk about my work, but we wrote a program, a uh, former student of mine, uh, or not student, postdoc of mine, a student of Ian Holmes in collaboration with Ian uh, here at Berkeley. We wrote a program called FSA, which implemented algorithms that I won't discuss today that are based on this kind of partially ordered set view of alignments and produce this kind of statistical information. And I actually think that that's kind of the key, because 
in the absence of this uncertainty in information, you, you can't make sense of, of alignments. So that's what really biological sequence alignment is all about, sequence alignment, is sequences that have a shared evolutionary history where you'd like to understand that history and understand your uncertainty in declaring it. Because if you think about the big forest for all three billion nucleotides in the human genome and all species, 50,000 vertebrates or uh, mammals, I think, actually, um, you know, you're, you're going to not be able to resolve for every nucleotide where it goes and who it, who is its, its part. You're going to have to do the statistics. So that's what sequence alignment is. Yes. I've been struggling to say whether I should say something or not, but yeah. I'll, I'll say it anyway. Um, you don't even explain where statistics come from. I haven't explained it because that's not what my tutorial is about. Yeah, but when you have a pair, how are you, how are you going to uh, come up with all these evolutionary stories? If you want to relate... So, you, if, if you would like to take a pair and come up with a meaningful statistical estimate of the reliability of your alignment, you need to have lots and lots of sequences. Doing string align sequence alignment on a single pair of sequences is sort of, in a sense, hopeless, because your model is going to be fairly simplistic and not have enough data. So that is absolutely true. And this is kind of, uh, uh, you know, this is kind of a, a screenshot from a bigger picture just to like make this comparison. But you can't figure these settings out without a lot more information, and sometimes you just can't figure it out at all. Right, so so my, my point is very simple. Yeah. Anything that you can have statistical information about, you will be able to come up with an algorithm to model it. And you don't need uh, any statistics. Once, once you have a model, so it's... Well, it's not about whether you need or don't need statistics. The point is the output is a probability because it doesn't make sense to declare whether a, you know, that, I, that is my point. I, you see, it's not that I'm saying that you need a statistical method to do the alignment, although I happen to think we, you do, but we could argue about it. But my point here was different, that you, your output is a statistical information, a probability, because you cannot, uh, it, otherwise it just doesn't make sense. You cannot say this goes here, that goes there. That, that's kind of my key point. Yeah. So well, people, for example, yeah. in RNA already do that. In a way, uh, there's a lot of work in that direction. Right? There, we have the partition functions. And so, on. so actually, it's a very good point. So in RNA sequence alignment, there's exactly kind of very statistical physics point of view because the original folks were statistical physicists. And it's true, although it's also true that very few folks, even in the RNA world, actually output, even for their programs, just practically speaking, the actual ensemble. They also tend to fixate on, okay, this is kind of, and, um, and RNA structural biologists really bothers them because there is no such thing as a single fold for, for, for molecules in vivo. Yeah. So as long as you've interrupted two brief notes, one is yes. that for a more detailed version of this and what's in Lunter, you can actually look at Ian Holmes's <coughs> thesis, he talks about it extensively. That's also very true, yes. Um, Good point. The second note is, um, coming back to a historical note, you mentioned that so kind of falling were the first one with protein alignments. That's Oh, partially true, but in fact, um, Kendrew and Prutz got the Nobel Prize in 1962 for their discovery of the structures of myoglobin and hemoglobin, and there were two important things they discovered when they solved the structures. One was that rather than being beautiful as they expected, they were these sort of writhing, disgusting, horrible things. Um, but the second thing was when they looked at the structures of myoglobin and hemoglobin, which were known to be evolutionary related to each other, they were able to see that they could align them together structurally, which in fact, that was a protein alignment, but it was a structural alignment. Then later on, actually, a after they got the Nobel Prize, they then were able to get the sequences. So the structures came long before the sequences. Exactly. When they aligned the sequences, they could not have told that those two proteins were related to each other from the sequences, even though it was immediately obvious from the structures. And I'm happy you said that because, as you can see, biological sequence alignment, when discussed with biologists, is very complicated. And it's absolutely true that you often want to do structural alignment. That's a whole other story. It yeah. doesn't go to the Zucker candle and Pauli work. Absolutely. Very true. Yes. When it comes to sequence alignment, I, yes. uh, I encourage you to have a look at, in fact, the paper that I, I was involved with, was yes. primarily was done with, by Hamid Chitsas, to find the partition function of two interacting RNAs. It's pretty much sequence alignment. Yes. It tells you. And the single reason yes. why we're not doing it is it's order n to the power 6. That's right. So, uh, so that's completely my, um, and I don't want to say preference, but that's what I believe one should do, is calculate these partition functions. The point of this project, and I'm not discussing it, is how to calculate, how to estimate 
these kind of probabilities without actually calculating the whole partition function. So then we should have a check because this we actually also applied, can apply to RNA and there's many things to discuss. And that's why I'm so happy that we finally have a computational biology program at the Simons. So, it's good. so the very last point I'll make about sequence alignment. Um, uh, there was actually a paper earlier this year, uh, well, last year, uh, showing a very nice result that edit distance is hard. And this is what we all work on. So the exact result by Buckers and Indic from MIT was that um, that edit distance cannot be computed in strongly subquadratic time, meaning that if you could do that, uh, then what's called the strongly exponential um, time hypothesis, Seth, would have to be true. And uh, it would actually be kind of nice in this program to go through that result, because this is kind of an interesting hypothesis that's debated whether it's actually true or not. I'm trying to recruit something. Yeah, so uh, it's not entirely true, clear whether this is actually true or not. This has to do with looking at KSAT and sequences uh, for the exponent at KSAT. It's a very interesting story. Um, you know, when this was written, people wrote about it that said, okay, well, it's basically going to be impossible to align two human genomes. I don't think that's true, because that's, as I just tried to say, that's not what you do with sequence alignment. Right? So, all right. So, yeah, it would be great to like, work through this result this semester. I think that's actually a good project. So, read alignment, now I'll get to the actual tutorial, um, is a different type of problem altogether. And it came about when people started generating reads from sequences. So, I'm not going to belabor or talk much about it. There's been sequences for a while. Uh, this is what they used to look like. Um, and sequencers produce sequences of DNA, but not very long sequences of DNA. Usually, uh, I mean, back in these days, a couple of hundred base pairs, reads. So reads are just a short bit of sequence that comes out of a machine like this. The machine would produce lots and lots of reads. Um, I'll say more about what reads look like today, but this was a new technology. And it really came online in the mid-90s. People started to actually get DNA sequences, uh, this machine sequenced DNA, by producing lots and lots of reads, these short tish sequences. And then they had to do something with them. And the first paper I could find that actually mentioned the word read alignment was um, a program called CONSED and FRAP uh, by Phil Green and his collaborators um, in 1998. And uh, they had this picture, actually, in the paper. And I believe this is the first read alignment, quote unquote. And here, what's going on is that you have strings, but they're reads. They, their DNA sequences came out of the machine. And many of them are the same. Because the nature of the way you use these machines is that you sequence the same DNA sequence over and over and over, for reasons that have to do with assembly and other things that I will not talk about today. And when you have these reads, what they did is they actually aligned them to each other. And actually what they did is they were, technically speaking, aligning the reads to contigs that were assembled from the DNA. So a contig is a longer piece of sequence obtained by gluing together the DNA. And then they took all the reads and they tried to compare them to the contig and to each other. And that was the first sequence line. And the goal here was to find errors in the sequence. Still today, an important thing to do. So, you know, uh, here they just didn't have uh, information. But, you know, you can see here, uh, if you look carefully, for example, here, there's some other little piece of sequence here. But everybody else says something else, so maybe that sequence was wrong. So this is a completely different thing than sequence alignment because there's no tree decorating these sequences. They're not related evolutionarily. There's no, they're simply the same sequence with error. That's all that's going on. And the goal is to find the error. Nowadays, sometimes the goal is to take a reference sequence that's previously been assembled, let's say from Schenck, his genome, and take my reads from my genome and find out where they're different. Because you see, he believes in straight up algorithms, computer science, and I like statistics, so we want to find out where in the DNA, like what makes us different. Okay? So, that, so then you want to align the reads to the genome. But uh, it's really got nothing to do with sequence alignment. It's a completely different question. And so the methods for doing this are very different. Um, so I tried to formalize a little bit um, 
for this talk, actually, like what a read alignment is. And I wrote a blog post about it a little while ago, if you want to go read, uh, preparing for this very slide. Um, this is kind of very crude and not precise, uh, because it's difficult to do this precisely, but I'll just try to do it crudely. You can think of sort of what a read alignment really is, OK? Is it's kind of a pair of maps where this calligraphy f, script f, is your set of all fragments. I prefer to call them fragments than reads, actually. It should be called re fragment alignment to the talk today, because sometimes these fragments are connected to each other somehow with other information. So I think of the set of fragments, and you kind of want to know for a collection of sequences, um, kind of where, first of all, these fragments come from. Yeah, we, we, which sequence did they originate from? You believe that these fragments are literally copies from some original sequences. And there's a whole bunch of them, and they're in the sati. Which one is this guy from? And then, when you, look, when you think about, so the sati here are the different contigs in FRAP. But once you pick the contig, you actually want to know this A right here goes with that A, and not that A over there. So you want to actually have a detailed map for every individual nucleotide here where it actually goes over there. And so that's this map L sub F. For a specific fragment, it gives you a map between the, this notation. That means the positions in that fragment and the positions in its specific target, which is why I used to. So why is that actually not a very precise definition? Well, if you would like to write this precisely, it becomes a kind of you know, uh, experiment for a mathematician and not particularly because the fragments can actually, because these are DNA sequences, they could be in reverse complement, and they could, they could be in pairs, and they could be all sorts of things, and then this just becomes like a whole lot of notation. But that's the basic concept I just intuitively wanted to get across. So that's the first thing. The second thing is an error model. In order to actually produce these maps, you need to know something about how there are errors in your sequences. Remember I told you that's the only thing that is in these sequences is error. And actually, um, I left this out because I just got tired. Every time I type FRAP, P-H-R-A-P, it's converted to FRAP. So let's just call it FRAP, OK. So the program FRAP, um, actually, it gave a score of 11 for a match, a minus 2 for a mismatch, minus 4 for a gap, and minus 3 for extending a gap. This is actually the, the, the logic inside FRAP. I went to look it up. Um, but your error model might be different. You might give a different score. You might give a probability if you even venture. Um, and uh, try to do some statistical thing. The next thing is that you need a kind of efficient data structure um, for computing this map psi. So you see, basically, when Phil Green did this, and it's kind of hard to put oneself in the mindset, but in 1998, uh, you know, you did, there, there, were no, there were no MacBook Airs. Uh, in fact, I, Apple was about to go bankrupt. Uh, and there were no, like computers constituted these sort of boxes that could add a tiny bit of memory and couldn't do much. And so it's a hor hard to put yourself in the mindset, but it was you know, very difficult to take all these sequences and just figure out which contig they came from. How, how do you do that? So, so what they did is they used the hash, which means they took exact subsequences and tried to find out whether they exist in one of the contigs. So standard computer science thing. And uh, that's how they did it in FRAP. And then finally, they actually needed to align this map L sub F, you know, each single individual base in the read. And in this FRAP paper, they used the banded Smith Waterman algorithm. Um, so, uh, you know, they're basically, um, this is FRAP, and it's actually, this is what read alignment is, big picture wise. All the following programs and software many years later, they're all kind of, this is basically what they do. They make different choices for this part, different choices for that part, different choices for this. But they do that, OK? So, so that's what they do. But in all this, you assume that the contigs are longer than five. Yeah, you, I mean, they weren't actually always very long, but you assumed they were longer than your reads, right? So yeah. They were very long. So and in FRAP, you assumed you had contigs to align to. That is correct. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Um, so a few years after FRAP, people started to generate a lot more data. And um, they actually kind of couldn't handle, like, they really needed, uh, in fact, in 2001, they published the human genome. 
And then people wanted to take the reads and find out where in the human genome do they align to. Now it's not a contig anymore, but a 2.8 billion base pairs, well, divided into chunks, but, but a huge amount of sequence. And that's actually, I finished my PhD in 99, so I was just coming online right then. Um, and people needed a tool to do this, so they used BLAST. And uh, people actually still use BLAST to do read alignment sometimes, because they don't know uh, that they shouldn't. Okay, but that, it's a really bad idea, but they still do that. Um, because it's just been around for so long. I just wanted to say for a second what BLAST did. What BLAST actually did is, it kind of um, it did a similar thing, kind of first kind of used a hash to find exact matches, and then kind of tried to extend those matches. And there's a nice theory behind BLAST, where now you don't do a smith waterman line, but you're starting with your exact match, you sort of walk along, and you actually have this random walk when you have a match. Uh, you move up, and when you have a mismatch, you move down. And this example here corresponds to that one. And your statistic you test is how high is it from the troughs to the peaks, this y sub max. And Sam Carlin and, um, and Altschul, they proved some theorem um, that uh, gave sort of a distribution for these trough to peak heights on which you could build a test to actually pull out significant matches. Right, so that's what they did. This program was designed for sequence alignment. Well, let's say you take one protein sequence you want to compare it to another in a database, or one DNA sequence compared to another in a database. So it's actually complete, again, it's sort of apples and oranges. So you don't really want to do this. Um, but I did want to tell people in this program that it, if they'd like an exercise for warm up, it's actually the study blast because nobody has actually ever looked, except to my knowledge, a student who took a class I took did a final project on this actually calculated the exact statistics, which you can now do, because now computers are pretty good. And look at whether this actual approximation is any good, and it turns out it's not very good. So that's another interesting thing to do. But yeah? It's empirically for proteins. It's yeah. extremely it's, it's, uh, okay. But everything except for DNA. And, and I can tell you why. Because the thing is, this approximation is good when n, the size of the sequence is small. As the sequence gets longer and longer, approximation deteriorates. And since proteins are pretty bounded in length, that's why it's pretty good for proteins. So the heuristics in the yeah. blast for DNA dominate, whereas that's right. for proteins, that the, the heuristics play a minor role. Exactly. So, so interesting to study for the theoretical purpose, maybe not so practically, although there's still a lot of databases where people do need to blast honest you know, sequences that are evolution related. So it would be an inch, another interesting little project for, for the semester. Yes. So the problem of fitting this pattern into a longer text yes. is a different statistical problem than the one Blast goes for. Uh, I agree. Yeah, that's, that's my point, really. Yeah. That was why I mentioned it. Um, I thought I'd tell people what not to do as well, so, or what people shouldn't. So there have been a lot of improvements in technology. And the unfortunate thing about read alignment, and the hard part about working on it, is you have to be very technology savvy. As I said, molecular, for example, there was a big hoopla about it two years ago. It takes a while to write a paper in a method. is now kind of obsolete. Um, and this is how fast the technology is moving. And it started really moving around 2003. Um, this is from the PhD thesis of Atif Rahman, a former student of mine. He made this plot. Um, the size of the circles, the radius, is the read length uh, and log scale of that technology. and the thickness of the boundary is the error rate of the technology. And uh, this is the year, and this is the cost. And you know it's going there. Um, starting in 2003, uh, about $100 million to sequence the DNA necessary to get a genome, now 1,000. And you can just see that this is log scale. This is an extraordinary rapid increase in speed of generating reads. You can also see why Google Scholar didn't find anything in books, because this, if you kind of look at it, I mean, aside from this one bubble here, there's kind of really a phase transition here, where suddenly there's a lot of stuff. So people just didn't work on it, but it was a good problem to work on. And now these machines, of which there are many at all of your institutions, generate a huge amount of reads every day, terabases per run. Um, and I don't like to like emphasize how much data there is because there's just a, a, this plenty. So let's just leave it at that. And all these reads need to be aligned. Why do they need to be aligned? So let me say a word about that. 
Um, so, oh, actually, well, uh, le yeah, let me skip to why in a second. Um, how are they aligned? I was going to pour into this to tell you what people did do in 2008. So in 2008, people started writing papers, and there were a couple of <laughs> programs that were published. Um, both have BWA, Mac, all sorts of programs. This is from a paper by Hengli in 2010, reviewing what happened in the history from 2008. And they actually used basically two tricks. And to this day, there's now more tricks, but there's two main tricks. And one is hashing, to take exact subsequences in the reads and check where they match to. And the other is the use of what's called an FM index. And I'll just tell you a little bit about why, what that is um, before I tell you more about why people align. So you heard about the Burroughs Wheeler transform, and the FM index is basically an extra decoration on top of the Burroughs Wheeler transform. Here's what it is. So you have a string, abracadabra, and you, take, you add a dollar sign to the end, and then you cyclically permute it in all n ways, if it's got n letters, in this case 12, and you put it in a matrix. You then sort the rows of this matrix by the first character. Dollar comes first. And then you see you have um, A, uh, B, B, C, D, R, R, A, D, A, L, C. You guys see that there, right? OK. Um, and now what you do um, is you, um, so this sorting actually turns this into kind of what's called a suffix array, which you also heard about. And in your usual Burroughs Wheeler transform, you just ignore all of this and you record this string here. And actually, before I even say anything else, I, a personal goal for the semester is to find some combinatorialists to think about this because in the study of the Burroughs Wheeler transform, people haven't actually thought so much about this. is kind of a map. Um, uh, it's a sort of a permutation map, and it has very interesting properties, some of which I've conjectured a little bit. Um, so it'll be interesting to study. But in the LF transform, you have another sequence here, F, OK? <coughs> Excuse me. And if you look at um, <coughs> oh. the point of the sequence F is to be able to map the positions L, uh, the sequences in L to the positions in the sequence. And there's actually been in new insight in stringology of this stuff to do this kind of mapping with mismatches. So I'm getting out of time, and I won't talk more about this today, but you, very, very interesting maps, very interesting computer science, and a lot of progress, actually, on milking more out of the basic burroughs wheeler transform via this LF transform, uh, which basically adds to this position, as a, L, to this string L, as I've said, a couple of extra maps. So what are read alignments used for? Before, before yes. Before, yeah. Maybe you should explain what's the difference between what you can get out of Powers Wheeler transform and a suffix array or a suffix tree. Okay. So what you get out of um, a Burroughs? So no, I don't want to answer your question in detail. But what I will say is that the point of the Burroughs Wheeler transform is that instead of storing a matrix, which is n squared because you have n permutations and a sequence of length n, you store a sequence of length n. That's the point. So, so whatever you have in, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, and more than that, yeah, yeah. the single point of Barrow's Wheeler transform is you're going to pay just two bits because you have a limited alphabet per location rather than log n bits. In, in a, it, That's it. I mean, this has to be really, really well nailed because people don't seem to understand it. Yeah, that's what I said. That's, that's in and a nutshell what you want to do. In which, yes. which guarantee you that in the worst case, you Sorry? cannot do string matching. You cannot do string matching based on a suffix tree or a suffix array. You, sorry, what's that? That point I didn't understand. No, there are some lower bounds. So whatever combinatorial technique you may use, in yes. the worst case, if you're using uh, uh, a suffix tree like uh, data structure, yes. there are lower bounds that, that tell you that you won't be able to do it uh, in sub-exponential time. Time is another matter. I said the point here is space. Of the, yeah, that's kind of the point here. But you're right. Yeah, there are bounds on suffix arrays, but here the point was space. And it came about specifically because the human genome is about 3 billion base pairs. And um, suffix 
tree is an array are difficult, space-wise. That's the basic point. I agree. <coughs> so what are read alignments used for? So uh, this is a picture from a kind of browser of read alignments. So each gray bar here is a read. And they're all stacked upon each other. And they all have sequences in them which are not shown. But here, you can actually see the sequence. And you can see that actually the sequence in the reference that you align to has a T, all your reads have a C. So they have, so I said that in read alignment, it's very simple. There's a reference, there are reads, and there are errors. But I didn't say where the errors are. The errors could be in the reads, but the errors could be in the reference. And I'm using the term error here kind of loosely because sometimes it's not really error. People slightly abuse read alignment by comparing, let's say, as I said, a genome from one person to the reference of another. It's not quite that these sequences came from this one. So that's one thing people do with read alignments, is they try to find differences like this. Okay? But another thing that people try to do with read alignments, and in fact, by far has become the more, most widely used, most common thing to do with read alignments, is to count. And so there's a whole bunch of new essays where you'd like to measure something and count it. And in order to do that, you sequence. Okay? Now, how do you do that? So the kind of reduction. You'd like to measure something. You do some biochemistry. And you make DNA sequences that if you were to sequence them and count how many of the different types you got, you can go and figure your measurement back. So what is the singular assay of this kind that's most widely used and therefore has become the dominant application of DNA sequencing and read alignment is prenatal testing. So starting about two or three years ago, maybe a bit more, people started looking at the application of the fact that there's um, fetal DNA in the plasma of mothers while they're pregnant. And therefore, by sequencing DNA from the plasma and counting read alignments to chromosome 21 specifically, um, you could figure out whether the fetus has trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. This is now almost the standard procedure soon, probably, I think it's already, many of my friends who are pregnant um, have actually had this procedure done. It's almost certain to become standard for every single child born anywhere in the world, that you would sequence uh, their DNA, because you can look actually from any kind of abnormalities, and sometimes it's useful to know that um, before the birth. So this has become the dominant mode of sequence alignment. In addition to that, there are a variety of molecular biology assays that rely on the same principle. There are now hundreds. The first one was published in 2007. It's called ChIP-seq. And I won't say that much about it because I'd like to leave some time for questions. Did you have a question? Or? So, no. um, so this is an assay for measuring where protein binds DNA. And the yoga here is to take the protein and do various things and end up with DNA sequences that when you align them and you look where they aligned, well, that was the signature for the protein bound there. Hopefully. Um, another assay is RNA-seq, uh, which is sequencing of RNA. So the idea here is kind of similar. We have a, what we might call a transcriptome in a cell or tissue, in a single cell or in a tissue, a collection of cells in bulk RNA-seq. And you'd like to know how much of each transcript there are. So now the set T is all transcripts. And you do a bit of magic, and you can convert the RNA into DNA that you can sequence. And then by aligning the DNA to the targets, you can figure out how much of each one you have. So again, a very common assay. And as I just said, there are now many, many such assays. And I'm not going to go through them for this particular tutorial, but there are literally dozens of such assays that measure everything from the, uh, the you know, accessibility of chromatin, um, methylation of DNA, binding of proteins to DNA, binding of RNA to DNA, um, structure of RNA, translation via ribosome profiling, uh, where the ribosomes are located on the transcripts. Um, just a ton of assays, and they're all about counting, and so people are all doing read alignment to do all these things. Right? Okay, so 
let me just say a word about sequence counting. In essentially all of these assays, let's say trisomy 21, the question is, you have a read. This is chromosome 1, 18, 21. You just want to know, is this read from chromosome 21, or is it actually from some other chromosome? Or did it have too many errors and I can't tell where it's from? That's what you actually care about. You, in the terms of the original maps I gave you, you don't care about the map psi. You don't, uh, uh, L sub, uh, sorry, L sub f. You care about psi. You care, is this from here, is this from here? You don't actually care to detect trisomy 21. I mean, you might care, it might be useful. But at least the way they do it now, you just care, is this from here? You don't care whether that specific base is from there or from there. I mean, who cares? Okay. You're going to count how many copies of this there are relative to the other chromosomes. Because in trisomy 21, there's an extra copy. So that's an insight. And um, by now, well, about two years ago, actually, my former student, Nicholas Bray, sort of had what I'd call an elementary but important insight, which is that um, this is actually what you really care about, is this map psi. That's it. And he noticed that essentially all read alignment programs were producing the maps L sub f. So the point of the bars ruler transform, um, I mean, you, well, you asked a different question, like what's the point of that relative to suff suffix arrays? But part of the point of the bars ruler transform is to be able to tell for every single base where it actually aligns. And in fact, the bowtie program, which is called bowtie because it's bars wheeler, um, uh, initially actually could not do alignments where there was an insertion or deletion because that's difficult to do with the bars wheeler transform. And for a number of years, when you were aligning reads, if there was an error of an insertion or a deletion, it just wouldn't align. And they fixed that in bowtie two. But it took two, I think more than two years, maybe 2000, yeah, it took a long time. And I don't know why, but I'll give some practical advice. People still use Bowtie 1 a lot uh, without indels, but not a good idea. So, so one point is that um, you pay a big cost with the Burroughs Wheeler transform. It's very, very difficult to massage it to be able to do these other things. So anyway, Nick had this idea that maybe pseudo-alignment could be computed much, much faster than alignments. And maybe that's all we care about. He called this pseudo-alignment. Um, and as I said, in terms of this kind of picture, you just said, like, let's throw away that information. And it turns out it's actually kind of an interesting question to ask, how do you pseudo-align very quickly? All right. So, I mean, in a sense, you people know kind of how to pseudo-align very quickly for a long time. Because you know if you build a hash, you can exactly match a sequence somewhere, uh, you know, essentially you have a dictionary you can look up sequences and their exact matches. Nick asks for something sort of different because, you know, that is asking for a lot. Sure, you can pseudo align by you know, asking for every base here to be exactly contained in one of your targets, figure out which target. Nick said, let's relax that assumption and just ask, can we tell where this aligns, allowing for errors, but not worrying about the individual base per alignment. And we actually searched a lot. And we couldn't find anybody that done this, even though it's a very obvious question. So we thought about it a bit, and one of our colleagues, Paul Melstead, is a computer science professor at the University of Iceland, had a nice idea of how to organize this. And I'll tell you a bit about the algorithm, because I actually came to believe, and I really believe this now, that we don't actually care to study the bars ruler transform anymore, or the FM index, or suffix arrays for this application, because I don't think you actually want to align reads. Basically ever. Okay, so I've become convinced of this that you should never align reads. So I didn't want to teach you how to do it. But I want to teach you how to do this. All right. So what's the idea? So Paul had the idea that you build the, the brain graph from the targets that you're trying to align to. And here I've given the example of transcripts. So these are transcript sequences. So green continues here with the gap, blue continues there. But these could be any targets. And the idea is that you'd like to build a de brain graph from them. Now, I know many of the folks in this audience know a lot about the brain graphs because they're used in assembly. This is not the kind of, this has nothing to do with assembly. The, you're not assembling reads here, but you're building a kind of data structure that is used in assembly. It's the same exact data structure. It's just a different repurposing of the same 
data structure. What you do here is you take k-mers from these sequences, so short sequences of length k, and you declare two k-mers to be adjacent in a graph if they overlap in all but their single ends, single end base pairs. So the k-mers tile this graph. It's a graph. And the actual targets are kind of paths along this graph, so they overlay this graph. So green is there, but you see blue has an, and, and, and pink have an extra piece, so they you know, they go over like that. So you build this data structure, very simple data structure. You can build this data structure very efficiently. Um, it's very easy because you just extract the k-mers and, you know, sequentially just glue them onto each other. So we've actually found in practice for the kinds of read alignments we do that you'd use like the 31 mer um, that's because reads nowadays kind of start at 50, 75, 150, sometimes 250. You know, in the old days, reads were 30 base pairs. You would use a smaller k, but we use k equals 31. Um, we also choose k to be odd because it turns out to build these, when you build these graphs, and I've glossed over this detail today, you know, sequences in DNA come in the forward and in the reverse complement. And you actually identify the k-mers and the reverse complements in this data structure. It's more convenient that way. And when you do that, you can do even k, but it gets complicated. And the reason it's a good exercise to figure out why it's complicated. So I'm not going to tell you. You can think about what it is about reverse complements and odd sequences that go well together. Um, so we create this thing. We call it a trans target to brain graph. That's kind of what it stands for. Uh, you can index very quickly on a big genome and in very low memory. So all that stuff about Burroughs wheel chance from you don't have to worry about. Now, if you have a read that's an ex that comes exactly from one of these targets of John here, comes from pink. So that's this piece of sequence glued to that one. And it has no errors in an ideal world. Then your cameras are consecutive in this graph. Right? That's just a fact. Um, Actually, let me say a word about if they have errors. There's two cases. If you have an error in one of these cameras, actually, most likely it's not in the graph. For it to be in the graph, well, you'd have to have a camera, you have to have a sequence somewhere else in your target sequences that's exactly the same, but off by just a tiny bit. That happens. There are duplications in all these targets, but not that common. Usually, when you have an error, you just won't find your camera. All right, so what you do now, and this is the whole idea. We actually got a paper out of this. It's like kind of ridiculous because it's so simple. But sometimes just you do something and nobody thought about it before. Is you look up each of your cameras in your read, and you do that with a hash, so that's very fast. So you look up camera, and you know, oh, it goes there, camera goes there, camera goes there, camera goes there, camera goes there. And you just look up, you've stored for each of these cameras in this graph, you've just stored the colors. So you know this one. It comes from green, pink, and blue, and so on. And you just intersect these colors. <coughs> and by taking that intersection, you now find out that this specific read actually had to come from blue or pink, could not have come from green. Okay? So that's basically an algorithm, not necessarily the algorithm, but an algorithm for doing quick pseudo alignment. Now, in our paper that we wrote about this, we do a lot of tricks. For example, here's an idea. When you look up this kamer, in this data structure, you can simply record how far away that node is from that node. And if you know that there's no splits in between this node and that node, then there's no point to look up this camera as well. You might as well just go to the intersection. You're not going to learn anything new because all the colors are the same. And actually, we've now shown that for just using this kind of trickery, for most reads, you can pseudo align them by looking at two cameras. Actually, even one single camera, but then you allow yourself some errors. So that means that you can take an entire read and just glance at it and figure out where they should go. So we wrote a, prog uh, we wrote a program to do this. Um, it's called Callisto, and it performs this pseudo alignment. Um, it makes read alignment tractable on the laptop. It's really fast. Um, there's a really interesting algorithmic question, maybe for the semester. We haven't thought about this too much, but it is an interesting question. This has not been looked at, really, is sort of with respect to pseudo alignment. I should have written pseudo alignment here. Like, what are kind of lower bounds and upper bounds? You know, what are lower bounds, let's say, 
uh, by upper bounds, I mean actual algorithms, that can do this kind of thing with respect to specific error models and specific models of the sequence that you assume. So, you know, let's say assume a sequence is Markovian, you have a certain kind of error rate, then what's the actual optimal way to do actual pseudo alignment? So now you allow yourself to, you know, you don't care to align the bases, just you want to get the target right. And can you get the target right some large percentage of the time? So I don't know if theoretical work in this direction, that would be interesting to do. The goal is to basically be able to do this um, much faster than, you know, sub-sublinearly. Our current implementation of this, the whole thing, runs in about four times, maybe five times word count. So that's to say if you take your reads and just count the characters, it's about five times as long. So, but you'd like to be going much lower than that, and hopefully then, be, then all these large numbers of reads don't no longer an issue for you. All right, let me, let me just conclude with one last piece. I know everybody's a bit tired and one and a half hours is a long time. There's a kind of final problem that goes along with read alignment that I haven't discussed, but that's crucial to it. And that is that the reads actually came, you believe they came from the targets. That's the model here. There's no evolutionary relationships. But, you know, you, at the end of the day, you try to count how many reads you had from each target. So in a nice universe, that's all good. And you can write out the likelihood for seeing, you know, this many reads from green, red, and blue, and do your statistics for your, for your measurement that you were trying to do by counting. Actually, if you wanted to estimate the proportion of blue, you just take the number of counts here divided by the total. It's not rocket science. But in practice, in read alignment, there's a key issue, which I've not addressed, which is that the alignments frequently come up as ambiguous. This happened in my previous cartoon, where that little read was ambiguous to pink or blue. Most reads come up ambiguously because genomes are highly duplicated, and because reads to this day are kind of short. Now, one thing, uh, I think I had a point about this uh, towards the end, but people often ask me why I work on this problem, because, you know, guys are hard at work, people are hard at work trying to like, get long, long reads. You hear about it in the news all the time. So I'll be out of business soon, because once the reads are long, it's all kind of a trivial problem. Actually, eventually, there's just one read. You, know, you start in the beginning of the molecule, read to the end of the molecule. It's like, what's there to do? I don't have time today, but in many of these assays, you will, not, you will never get long reads because the nature of the counting is such, the nature of preparing the DNA, that you just, it doesn't make sense to get long reads. Biologically, you can't get them. So that's a key point to keep in mind. And because of that, the reads are often ambiguous. And so what do people do about that? So there's all sorts of ambiguity that happens, and your data is really not the counts of red, green, and blue, but this whole mixture of colors. Um, and so what people do is they write out a likelihood function um, where you take the product over all the subsets of colors, and then you sum up uh, the probability for each of the different categories and these alphas are the probability you came from red or green or blue. And you take it to the power of the number of reads you saw from that category. Um, and these categories, these subsets, uh, they have a name now They're called equivalence classes. Um, <coughs> and these kind of uh, pseudo alignments, uh, what they actually produce are equivalence class counts. So they're very perfectly suited for this kind of statistical framework. And uh, <coughs> what people do with this kind of framework is they run the EM algorithms from similar numerical optimization, so other, many other choices, to try to maximize for these parameters. Doing so is a key part of read alignment. Sometimes this is called read assignment. And it's an interesting problem into its own right. It requires a model, and um, anyway, I wanted to mention it in the tutorial. The basic EM algorithm is easy to understand. Um, you start out assuming that your targets have equal frequency. What you'd kind of like to do with these ambiguously mapping sequences is give them a probability from being from blue or green and so on. If you knew the actual abundances, well, you could declare the probability off the bat. You know, if there's, 
if red is twice as abundant as blue and you see a reed that's ambiguous between the two, well, it's twice as likely to come from red. But you don't know that, so you start off guessing that they're equal abundance. And then you take each of your reeds and you just proportion it, apportion it according to these abundances. So, you know, C, for example, ambiguous between blue and red, you give a half a count to blue, a half a count to red. And then you, you add up those fractional counts and you normalize everything to sum to one and you get a new pie chart. And then you split the reads according to the new pie chart. This is called the EM algorithm and it has been discovered many times, just like hierarchies and laminar families. Um, and this is an algorithm is kind of, I think gives a good intuition for what read assignment is doing. There are many different ways to do read assignment and um, many different algorithms for it. Um, so I'll end with that. I wanted to leave a little, couple of minutes for questions. Um, so to conclude a few final thoughts, I've just said this, that read alignment is a technology problem, but it will persist because there are many applications where the reads inherently need to be short. And this is a highly parallel way to make measurements by counting. It's a good, good assay. Um, this is a very, uh, in my mind, an interesting direction to explore. There's been all this work now on fast methods for read alignment. Um, and maybe there are some tech transfer to go back to, to sequence alignment and actually apply some of these ideas. I've had a couple of conversations with the folks who used to do sequence alignment. They all jump ship and many of them work on read alignment now. Uh, but sequence alignment is an extremely important problem and now is a better time than any to work on it because we have huge numbers of genomes now and no real knowledge of the algorithms and the statistics and all the ideas necessary to align them. So um, highly, un, you know, completely unsolved problem, and maybe one can go back and forth. Uh, I would love for somebody to write a, a read alignment Wikipedia page so that my next talk is easier to prepare. Uh, thank you very much. instead of alignments, because of course with any of the whatever favorite seek assays like ChIP-seq, you would want to know where it comes from. And so even for gene expression, of course, when you talk about alternative splicing, that's already sort of a gray zone, right? So you could think of H exon then being its own target essentially, but often there you already care how many reads are actually spent on the exon junction, and so for that you already need to know some position information and not just the assignment. So how far do you think that paradigm yeah, so I mean, there are definitely applications. For example, I'll give you one I think is even more in the direction you're asking about. For example, you know, people are interested to use RNA seq and the sequences that come out to find edits, uh, to do read editing. So that is to find specific differences between the reads and the actual targets. And sure, um, you know, that's, that's a kind of important thing to do. But I actually believe that pseudo alignment can solve those problems as well. Because the thing is, that, uh, you know, it would be interesting to write down a whole list of everything. We have kind of started in our minds and we have lots of ideas. But let's say something like read uh, editing. You don't actually care to align the vast majority of the reads. What you actually care to do is to align the reads which actually have a difference with the actual targets. And if you think about that, in the course of doing pseudo alignment, it can actually be pretty easy to identify those reads, um, possibly. You know, you don't, so, so pseudo alignment can actually allow you to align, actually read align subsets of your reads possibly much, much faster than you would if you just aligned all of them. And so I would argue that even for read editing, even though the ultimate goal are read alignments for very specific reads, it's only for a very small subset. And I kind of feel that this is true for most of the cases where you would think of actual specific alignments. And, you know, once we, we've heard from a lot of biologists, they, um, I mean, I didn't say this, but you can actually kind of, you know, there isn't a, a, a complete, um, how shall I say, uh, uh, you know, read alignment, read pseudo alignment are not just completely separate. There's a spectrum in between. I didn't talk about it, but there's ideas that people call lightweight alignment or read mapping sometimes, although read mapping usually means read alignment, but let's say lightweight alignment, where you, in the light, you know, you, you can maybe extract not detailed alignment for every base, but you can maybe know the first base where it actually aligns to. And it turns out to be actually very easy to do that. Uh, for example, in the DeBrain graph, I won't pop it up again, 
you can actually store for each of those nodes where it is in the genome. And so you just, when you look up your first k mirror, you just ask, where is it? Now, to get a detailed alignment is complicated because you're going to have errors in the middle and you don't know where it goes where, but very fast to extract the beginning of the read. So I think those ideas will solve all the issues you, you raised. How does Callisto handle errors? Okay, so basically the way it's handling errors is that when you have an error, your 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 re, your your camer uh, does almost certainly not align. So that's good. You just ignore it. No. You, you, it's a variant. I mean, no, you want to care. I mean, no. you don't care to no. have every camer. It's just not a path in the graph. It's just not a path in the graph. Now, occasionally. You do have a camera that actually is in the graph somewhere else. And then you get basically, an inter when you take the whole intersection, you get the empty set. And then there's a number of interesting things you can do. You can kind of say, okay, let me go back and try to figure this out more carefully. And we can do that. So, um, or you can actually flag cases like this and put them in a bucket because it turns out, and we've been looking at them a lot, they're very interesting. Because there's usually, there's biology that underlines that actual case. So uh, that's in a nutshell. Can you go back to the pseudo alignment uh, figure? Yes. Uh, this one or? Uh, the, the next one. The one that shows. Okay, yeah. this one. So, with the exception of shrinking this uh, non bifurcating pass, yes. why do you need the graph at all? Because you're, you're only doing an uh, intersection of uh, cable. You know, of, uh, why are you actually storing the actual edges in the graph, you're asking? Yeah. Um, yeah, you don't really need to store the edges. It's true. No, you don't. Um, we actually, so when we first built this, we built, you know, we didn't know how well it would work, how fast it would be. We partly built this as kind of a research tool. And we have explored removing and adding all sorts of information in and out of this graph. But yeah, you're right. You don't actually care um, to know that this, you know, it's nice to know how far this camera is from the intersection. And so, in principle, if you know that for every camera, you can work back which are adjacent. But yeah, absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. So, with pseudo alignment, how uh, do you detailed alignment when you get the bucket of reads that are assigned? Yeah, so you can take those reads and do detailed alignment. Although, as I said to Uwe, you know, I think for most applications, you just want to know where those reads start. You know, I don't really see many applications where you truly need to take every read and do a detailed alignment for it. I just think that's never going to be necessary. Um, I mean, biologists are used to seeing those alignments in pictures, on screens, so they feel comfortable with them. But once you move away from that and just trust the algorithm, I, I don't see why you would care. It has no practical application for what you're actually working with. Um, if you don't know the transcriptome in details, oh, okay. if you're reconstructing, the um, we're working on reconstructing the same. So this is a very, very good point. But if you do not know your trans, if you do not know your transcriptome, you don't do read alignment. So then you do read assembly, right? And yeah, that's. So for example, like um, we're interested in knowing the transcript structures of pyRNA precursors. Yes. And we know they're in that genomic region. But we don't know how the splicing is going. Yeah. Will pseudo alignment to that region help with? So, extent? very good question. I've thought a bit about pioneers. They're, they're the hardest thing to work on. Yes. My suggestion for those would be work on something else. It's too hard. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, uh, no, I'm kidding. Yeah, very good question. I mean, so you're asking a really good question, and, and I should give an honest answer to it, right? Which is that. I give a slightly dishonest answer. It's not the case usually that you either don't know your, trans your targets and your transcriptome or you know it perfectly well. The reality is that even in the human or mouse, which are the most effort has been put into them, you know the transcriptome kind of, right? You're missing stuff. And what the point of the pseudo alignment is, is that you can take the vast majority of your reads and, al and assign, you know, align them or assign them even, and leaving yourself a very small bucket with which to actually do the alignments and work with, as I was telling you. And I think that's the right way to go about things, because then you can spend a lot of time and do really like assembly. And, and we've actually you know, done that. So we have not publishable work yet, but we have all sorts of experiments. It's partly why we're building these graphs. You know, we, 
we play with assemblers in our group, and we take, do things like take the reads that don't align, assemble them, see what comes out, see how, you know, yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. And I think that can totally help with things like these pyramids you're looking at. All right, thanks again. Thanks. Let's go have coffee.